periodista, es profesora de Derecho Internacional Público, comunitario, esta, esta distinción que hacemos los juristas, eh, nos va a hablar de un tema muy sugerente y lo va a hacer en inglés, razón por la cual yo también voy a continuar mi presentación en inglés, aunque nos pueda parecer un poco sorpresivo. La profesora la Moreno Lax habla perfectamente castellano, pero lleva tanto tiempo en Reino Unido y todos sus trabajos ¿no? están re, re, hechos en, en inglés y todo esto, que nos ha pedido que por razones de, de, de técnicas, digamos, de, de terminología técnica, nos mantuviéramos en el inglés. So I will go on just in English. Uh, for sure, not a better English than hers. That's really sure. Um, so, Professor Violeta Moreno Lax, she is a full professor of law in the Queen's Mary Law School. She's a founder of the Immigration Refugee Program and the Center for the Study of Border Migration and Law, uh, Border Control Migration and Law. Um, as, as such, I think that the, the lecture today is, is quite proper and very interesting. She's going to, to talk about the non-rescue strategy and in the Mediterranean, death as means of border control, which I mean, I, I think is provocative enough as a title, but it's probably intended to shatter a bit our conscience and to focus on this uh, dark shadow policy, uh, which sometimes is presented as an unintended result, but I think she's going to suggest something more than that. Um, I would like also to add that uh, Professor Moreno Lacks, um, she is both uh, a researcher, a professor, in the academic sense, but she's also uh, working in the GLAN, the, the GLAN, uh, the Global Legal, uh, the Global Legal Action, Action yeah. Network. Sorry, I'm, I'm really bad with with acronyms, uh, but I know this GLAN or GLAN as one of uh, the best teams for strategic litigation on this area. And I'm following it closely, well, I wouldn't say closely, but we, were, we are learning a lot from that. So she's combining something which is not that frequent in, in this area, which is academy and kind of practice through a strategic litigation, which is a matter which really interests us a lot. And sometimes in the master we have been mentioning this. In, at least in the legal, in the legal modules. Uh, I will just mention also that she has been teaching at Oxford and in Liverpool, also in the Florence Institute, she had a position there. So, uh, and other topics she has been publishing uh, on monographs and recently on, on articles and reviews include extraterritoriality of border controls, uh, something I'm really interested in. Also, complementary and primary pathways, what we know as vías legales y seguras. Um, and questions related to uh, search and rescue in the Mediterranean. So, uh, I wouldn't be able to name so many people I would be really interested in having in this table uh, with us. So, thank you very much for being here and also uh, sometime soon joining the University of Barcelona, which she will be doing uh, quite soon. Thank you very much, Violeta, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you to the Institute for having me here today. I have a PowerPoint, and um, I need the screen to show the slides.
Okay, so thank you all very much for being here today. Also those joining online, if there is anybody on the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll try to keep you awake for the next 40 minutes and I'm going to be talking about the EU non-rescue strategy, death as a means of border control. And I'm going to be doing that in four steps, right? Um, for those who do not know the context, I'm going to be providing a number of key facts and figures about maritime migration across the Mediterranean. We are then going to turn to the legal background in international law defining state powers and state obligations of relevance to this topic. And then we will go, we're going to be zooming into the EU dimension, and we're going to look at the new paradigm which is emerging of interdiction by omission, as I call it. And from there, we're going to be looking at not practice, but the Europeanization, the formalization by the European Commission of this new paradigm in law, or at least in policy. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the new Pact on Migration and Asylum, and the specifically proposed common European approach to search and rescue, which are two documents tabled by the European Commission in September 2020, which I'm going to claim entrench death as a means of border control. And the theoretical lens that I'm going to be using to problematize these developments is necropolitics. And for those who do not know about necropolitics, I have, in a nutshell, the condensed version of this. Necropolitics was formulated by a Healy member in 2003. He's a philosopher from Zimbabwe, and he uh, theorizes sovereignty as the power and capacity to dictate who lives and who dies. That's the ultimate power that the sovereign, the state, or a regional integration organization such as the European Union has over populations, including migrant populations. For him to exercise sovereignty is to exercise power, control over mortality, and to define life as a manifestation of power. Okay? So the sovereign possesses the right to kill, to allow to live, and to expose to the risk of dying, which is what interests me and the subject of today's talk. And this right to expose somebody to die can happen through outright executions, through direct means of killing, or through indirect invisible means of killing, which is what I'm going to be discussing and problematizing today death by omission or death through non-rescue, as the strategy of the European Union is, constitutes a practical manifestation of necropolitics, as I'm going to claim today. And I have a number of facts and figures that I wanted to share with you to contextualize my thesis, right? So um, when we put the developments in the Mediterranean in um, its historical perspective, we can look at what, what has been happening through the oceans for more than 40 years. There is a film, uh, I don't know if the slides are going to be shared with you, but if they are, you will see that you can click on the video by UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which in 2014 devoted a plenary session of the High Commissioner um, dialogue, high dialogue on protection, precisely to what happens in the Mediterranean and what happens at sea. And they prepared this picture, this chronicle of 40 years of death when irregular migration happens at sea. And they start documenting the phenomenon in the 70s through the Vietnamese exodus across the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean in search of asylum in other countries, specifically Australia, but also others. They then continue documenting the exodus of Haitians and Cubans across the Caribbean Sea to reach the US in the 80s, and the exodus of Albanians across the Adriatic to reach Italian shores in the 90s. There is an explosion of recourse to the Mediterranean Sea and uh, sea crossings generally as a mechanism to reach protection, to reach international protection, to reach asylum, as a direct consequence 
of the illegalization of migration for the purposes of international protection. The withdrawal of visas, the introduction of career sanctions, the introduction of mechanisms that impede travel in search of asylum have a reflection in recourse to the maritime environment as a route towards reaching safety. And so through the 2000s, we see Afghans taking the Bengal Bay in search of asylum elsewhere, sub-Saharan Africans crossing the Mediterranean in masses, Ethiopians and Somalis taking the Gulf of Aden, and Iraqis going through the Greek archipelago from Turkey in search of asylum. In the 2010s, after the Arab Spring and the um, beginning of the Syrian civil war, we see, as we see still today, loads of Syrians taking the Mediterranean in search of asylum um, through the central route in Italy and Malta. And if we zoom into death rates, we can see that there are nearly 50,000 casualties registered since 2014 by the Missing Migrants Project of IOM, the International Organization for Migration, which is recently become a body of the United Nations and started documenting in 2014 death at sea as a specific phenomenon that required particular attention from the international community. And what is very striking is that the Mediterranean, although being the most surveilled portion of water in the earth, registers 50%, nearly 50% of the total casualties occurred at sea since 2014. And this, I hope, should steer the collective consciousness of European countries, and in particular, the European Union. And what we're going to discover today is that this hasn't really been the case. And actually, there's been the opposite trend, an instrumentalization of the risk of dying as a mechanism of control of migration and control of borders. In the Mediterranean specifically, when you look at the numbers, absolute numbers show a decreasing trend in absolute casualties. So the number of deaths peaked in 2015 during the so-called refugee crisis of the summer of 2015. There was then uh, the, the top, top rate in 2016, and then a decrease in numbers until today. What, is, what the figures do not tell us, and I have another slide to demonstrate my claim, is that there's also been a 90% decrease in the number of arrivals. Through the incorporation of interdiction mechanisms, less people have managed to reach the other side of the Mediterranean shores. So, Although, in absolute numbers, less people have been dying, in relative numbers, the risk of dying has exponentially increased. And I'm going to show you this later. The other element that I wanted to highlight is the fact that the central Mediterranean, again, although it being the most surveilled portion of the Mediterranean Sea, registers the highest number of casualties and there aren't any physical, geographical reasons why they should be so. The central Mediterranean is not different in terms of currents, weather, geographical obstacles that people need to overcome to reach safety on the other side. And yet, 18, uh, so 18, um, uh, yeah, 18,000 deaths have been recorded in the central Mediterranean compared to 2,500 in the Western Mediterranean and 1,800 in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the why the mortality of the Central Mediterranean needs to be found not in weather conditions, geographical obstacles, or things that are beyond man's control, right? So I think there is more that meets the eye and that needs to be investigated. Something else that we should focus on is the nationalities of those that are taking the Mediterranean as a mechanism to reach safety, as a route to asylum. When you look at the top citizenships of asylum applicants in the European Union in the last couple of years, you see that the top nationalities are Syrian and Afghani. Okay? And these are also the most common nationalities detected reaching the, the Italian and Greek shores 
upon the crossing of the Mediterranean. You have Afghanistan first, Syria afterwards, because these are the numbers of 20, 2022 and 2021. Okay, so the conclusion should be that the Mediterranean route is actually an asylum route. People taking this route are people who need international protection and not only need international protection, but are entitled to asylum as a right under international law. And we are not taking heed of this right and this need in policy making within the European Union. The other two conclusions that we should extract from these facts and these figures is that the Mediterranean is the deadliest border in the world. It has been compared to a mass grave where the life of unwanted migrants doesn't have value, or if it has, it has very little value, at least for policymakers. And something that should also strike us is that the route is not new. We are saying that the first crossings were recorded more than 30 years ago, when the Albanians were taking the Adriatic to reach safety in Italy from 1991. So despite the emergency rhetoric, the crisis rhetoric, we're not talking about something unforeseeable. We're talking about something that is happening for 30 years. So there's more than enough time to the policy makers to try and foresee what is going to happen and to adopt policies that are responsive to the needs of people and to the repetition of this phenomenon through time and space. What is that international law requires states to do? If you zoom into the law of the sea, as we're going to do, we're going to see that depending on the stretch of water where things happen, states have more or less powers to control their borders and more or less obligations owed to those encountered at sea. I have highlighted three zones that we're going to be talking about. The territorial sea stretching 12 nautical miles from the baseline. The baseline is the point where the earth meets the water. Okay, from that point on, the territorial sea stretches 12 nautical miles. An extra 12 nautical miles would be the contiguous zone, but the contiguous zone for all means and purposes, belongs to the high seas. And this is important. That's why you have the two circles, one encircling the other. In the high seas, freedom of navigation applies, and freedom of navigation for everyone, regardless of nationality and circumstances. It doesn't matter whether we are talking about a terrorist suspect, an irregular migrant, a refugee, or indeed ourselves, anyone on the high seas enjoys freedom of navigation. Okay, what are the powers that states have in these different areas of the sea? Within the territorial sea, full jurisdiction or near full jurisdiction applies, meaning that states have full police powers to enforce their immigration laws as they would on dry land, as they would in their territorial domains according to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, so the UNCLOS. According to UNCLOS, in the contiguous zone, that area of the open sea, the high seas, that international law accords specific, a specific status, stretching 24 nautical miles from the baselines, police rights exist for states to prevent the breach of customs, fiscal, sanitary and immigration laws. And so people interpret this as international law providing a power of interdiction on the part of states to impede unauthorized entry into their territory. When you move further out on the high seas, beyond the point of the contiguous zone, there aren't any obvious interdiction powers that international law grants states. States only have a right of visit to verify the nationality of ships, okay? To, com to make sure that the ship is not engaging, for example, in piracy or in any other activity that international law would consider illegal. Some people would interpret that there are interdiction powers against flatless vessels, vessels without a nationality. 
like the dinghies, the boats, that are typically employed by regular migrants to reach safety on the other side of the Mediterranean. They would normally be traveling on unseaworthy vessels, on boats which are not registered, have not been marked, do not fly a flag, okay? They are called flatless ships. And against them, the doctrine is divided. Some would think that the right of visit includes a right of interdiction. Another part of the doctrine thinks that this is not so, and that states would only, uh, that these ships would only be subjected to the jurisdiction of states if they engage in irregular, illegal activities, okay? In a third country's territorial waters, for example, the waters of Morocco, or the waters of Libya, or the waters of Turkey, third countries, say, Italy, Malta, Spain, or Greece would have no jurisdictional powers whatsoever unless they are explicitly authorized by the country concerned in written form or at least through tacit concern, consent in a bilateral agreement, typically taking the form of a treaty but also through soft law mechanisms like a memorandum of understanding. Okay? But otherwise, they would have no powers of interdiction. They would not be able to stop unwanted migration flows unless they've been given permission to do, to do that by the territorial sovereign. Apart from state powers, what international law provides are for a number of obligations. Obligations that tame, regulate, and limit the reach of these powers. And so, one specific family of obligations that are important in this, in this context are those pertaining to search and rescue. The duty to render assistance at sea and to proceed to the rescue of persons in distress and at risk of being lost. Okay? This is a universal obligation that engages all states, whether landlocked or coastal states, uh, according to Article 98 of UNCLOS and according to the Search and Rescue and Safety of Life at Sea Conventions, the SAR and SOLAS Conventions. Okay, so this is a universal obligation binding every state to require the master of a ship flying its flag to render assistance and to rescue persons in need of succour. Coastal states, on top of this, have a duty to engage in coast watching and the rescue of persons in distress proactively. They need to develop search and rescue services and define the specific areas of responsibility where they are going to be providing those services, what we call search and rescue regions. And the objective is that through all these means, human life is preserved. Okay, and after amendments passed in 2004 to the SAR and SOLAS conventions, what has become clear is that within each SAR region, the responsible state has primary responsibility to ensure the coordination necessary and the cooperation needed so that search and rescue operations lead to the delivery of survivors to a place of safety and conclude with their disembarkation on dry land. So they do not have an obligation to provide for a port of disembarkation within their own jurisdiction, within their own territory, but they need to make sure that rescued people are going to be disembarked and are going to be disembarked in a place of safety worthy of the name. Place of safety that procures and ensures safety. How has this been interpreted? This has been interpreted quite universally as benefiting every person found in distress at sea, regardless of their status, whether they are regular or irregular migrants. And this applies everywhere at sea. It doesn't matter in which jurisdictional area, whether in the territorial zone in the contiguous zone or on the high seas, the person might be found. And although the term distress has not been defined in the maritime conventions or in the law of the sea, there is case law that makes clear 
that there needs not be immediate physical peril for a situation to be understood as a situation of distress. So people do not need to be drowning before our eyes to consider that they are in need of assistance. If they are traveling in an unseaworthy dinghy in overcrowded conditions without a motor, without fuel, without water, without provisions, with dead bodies on board, without equipment, and without a captain that knows how to maneuver the ship, all of that would amount to distress. And even if they are not literally dying before our eyes, they would be in a situation that requires assistance and that requires rescue. Rescue as a delivery to a place of safety, as we've said. And again, Although place of safety has not been defined in international law, what has been clarified in the SAR and SOLAS conventions, in the maritime conventions, is that the particular circumstances of survivors need to be taken into account, including their individual rights. So if they are looking for asylum, if they are entitled to international protection, that should be a consideration of where you should disembark them. If their life is at risk, that wouldn't be a place of safety. The place of disembarkation cannot be a place of persecution and cannot be a place where there is a risk of ill treatment. The principle of non refoulement needs to be respected. So, in a nutshell, certain rescue obligations need to be interpreted in light of international human rights and refugee law standards. And this includes not only the principle of non refoulement, but also a number of other provisions have, that have been uh, encapsulated, codified in international treaties that all of the European Union member states have ratified, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture of the UN, the Refugee Convention, and for those which are EU member states, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. There you see that there are other rights that need to be taken into consideration on the side of states when they exercise their sovereign power to control migration and their borders, including the right to leave, the right to seek and obtain asylum, the right to life, the right to protection against refoulement, the prohibition of torture, and the prohibition of arbitrary detention, including through confinement at sea. And if any of these rights are violated, whether willingly or unwillingly, there needs to be access to a specific procedure where these violations are going to be looked into. And if a breach is detected, persons should be provided with a remedy. There is also a right to an effective remedy so that people can appeal any decision that has a negative impact on their rights. And all of these rights apply not only within the territorial jurisdiction of states, but also when they act at sea, when they intervene to intercept unwanted migrants that they would prefer they do not arrive to their shores. So Italy, Malta, Greece, Spain are subjected to observe these rights vis-a-vis -vis everyone, and they cannot pick and choose. They need to observe all of them, if applicable, at once. And as I said, these rights apply both inside state territory and at sea. Whenever a state exercises jurisdiction, sovereignty, or if you want, effective control, which is the term employed in international case law. So in a nutshell, what should happen is that when states intervene in the maritime domain, a balance should be found between their powers to control migration flows, to control their borders, and their obligations, which translate the rights of migrants and refugees found at sea. Now, is this what has happened when we look into what Europe has been doing so far? And the answer is not really. When zooming into the European dimension, we look at migration 
in the maritime context being portrayed, being defined, being presented as a situation of permanent crisis, as a permanent emergency that requires exceptional measures, exceptional measures that derogate from human rights protections, that disregard the human rights entitlements of migrants and refugees at sea. And so what we see instead of respect of these rights is the entering of obscure deals with third countries' coast guards like Libya, Morocco, or even Turkey on the part of Italy, Malta, or Spain. The transfer of funds from the European Union and its member states to third countries on the other shore to prevent the exit of unwanted migrants across the Mediterranean Sea, the policing and criminalization of the activities of the NGOs that provide rescue in the Mediterranean, the engagement of private vessels to conduct privatized refoulement, privatized pullbacks, privatized devoluciones en caliente, okay? Port closures, the declaration of own ports as being unsafe, and being inadequate for disembarkation in a strategic move so that people are not disembarked on European soil. Detention in floating centers close to the territorial waters of the member states concerned. And, and this is what I'm most interested in, the abandonment at sea of people in distress, letting them die, denying rescue. And this has happened on the part of Malta, Italy, Greece, and Spain, across all routes in the Mediterranean, the Central Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean, and the Eastern Mediterranean. So what has been happening in practice is that death has been used as a means of border control. The Mediterranean has become a site lying beyond the rule of law, where rights appear not to apply and not to be respected, where a state of exception has become permanent, a permanent spatial arrangement that remains continually outside the normal state of the law, paraphrasing member, okay? So I'm having recourse to the necropolitical framework that he formulated in 2003. Policy strategies, that I've already enumerated are based on the militarization and extraterritoriality, which implicitly or explicitly tolerate and systematically instrumentalize the risk of dying at sea as part of an effective control of entry. This is not something that happens at random. It has been incorporated as a means to control entry, as a means to control flows across the Mediterranean. The, there is a tactical disengagement, a tactical withdrawal from search and rescue, a negation of assistance to persons in distress through the abandonment of people at sea and letting them die that I think is problematic and fits the necropolitical paradigm. And I have two slides that I would like to show you to demonstrate my claims. The tactical disengagement from search and rescue has been happening progressively, starting from 2014, when the Mare Nostrum operation, which was a rescue operation led by Italy in the central Mediterranean, after the catastrophic disease of 3,000 people at the shores of Lampedusa in 2013, happened. So in response, the Italian government launched this Mare Nostrum operation, which was cancelled a year after because it was considered to create a pull factor. It was considered that it generated a call effect, un effecto llamada, that would attract people across the Mediterranean to Italy. And so Italy cancelled the operation. It was replaced by a Frontex operation, which didn't focus on rescue, it focused on the control of borders. Progressively, that operation reduced its operational remit to attend to a lesser scope of water. And so contact with people in distress was decreased. There were less instances where Frontex would be called upon to assist people at risk of dying. 
From 2019, the European Union actively withdrew naval assets. It took away vessels from the sea from two operations, Frontex and the Uniformed Operation Sofia, which was introduced to combat the trafficking and smuggling of migrants from Libya. Okay? And finally, vessels have been replaced by aerial means, by drones, that provide surveillance and intelligence information which is communicated to Libya, so that it is Libyan forces that intervene at sea, intercepting migrants and taking them back to Libya on the information provided by the European Union assets and the member states' assets that operate in the area. And in 2021, the cherry on the cake has been the policy of closing ports to migrants rescued in the Mediterranean on the basis of the risk of COVID contagion and their abandonment at sea until Libyan forces, Turkish forces, Moroccan forces would recover them to bring them back to ports of provenance. So in the other side of the, of the slide, you see a graph where you can appreciate in the pre-COVID era, um, the naval assets that had the higher numbers of rescues performed. In 2014, the top rescuer was the Italian Coast Guard. In 2018, the top rescuer has become the Libyan Coast Guard. In between 2016 and 17, the top rescuers were NGOs. So you can see that progressively, state-led rescue from EU member states and the European Union as a whole has disappeared. It doesn't exist. We do not have proactive search and rescue services led from the European side anymore. This has very concrete effects. The most outrageous of all is the increase in death rates. There is an increase in the probability of dying from 3% to 33% as a result of this policy. Okay? One in every 38 people were at risk of dying in 2017, according to UNHCR statistics, and there's been a tenfold increase up to 33% in just two years. Okay, so the ratio of dying, the risk of dying, the possibility of losing your life when engaging in a cross-Mediterranean journey has very exponentially increased. This is the practice. What happens from the legal side of the coin, the policy perspective? What is the European Union doing to respond with a coordinated co uh, cooperation-based response? And um, this comes in the form of the new Pact of Migration and Asylum, which, among other elements, introduces a specific plan on search and rescue. Okay? The overall objective of the new pact is apparently to manage and normalize migration. Search and rescue within this plan, it's portrayed as a moral duty and a legal obligation, but also as a key component of integrated border management, as a tool. Rescue is presented as a tool of border control. The key priority is to curb, to eliminate dangerous journeys and irregular crossings. And the main means to use is the common European approach to search and rescue. Okay? So the uh, common European approach to search and rescue is not just a program to deliver search and rescue. It is a program to manage migration and control borders. Not because I say so, because the European Commission puts black and white in its own documentation. The common European approach to search and rescue is defined in two instruments, the Commission Recommendation on Search and Rescue and the Commission Guidance on Criminalization. And it has two elements. One is containment and the other is prevention. Containment translates in impeding crossings by engaging with third countries, cooperating with third countries so that third countries, Libya, Morocco and Turkey, impede exits from their territories and therefore impede a priori 
journeys across the Mediterranean, and the arrival on European shores. And this is facilitated through the redefinition of what interdiction means. Interdiction activities are presenting, presented as life-saving, as activities that spare the life of migrants, that are equivalent to rescue, regardless of the real effects on the ground. And the other leg of the program is prevention. Prevention through reducing or withdrawing search and rescue on the part of the state and on the part of the European Union actors. And the second element is through the criminalization of all actors that facilitate irregular entry into the, the Schengen area, be it traffickers, smugglers, or even search and rescue NGOs. So if we take this elements one by one and this components, the effects are four. And I know that I'm running out of time and I'll be quick in unpacking these effects, but the effects are four. Overall, they, aug they augment the chances of dying at sea. They entrench the possibility of losing one's life as part of the policy strategy. Through the normalization of disengagement from search and rescue, through policing search and rescue NGOs activities that reduce the possibilities of being rescued at sea, through the criminalization of humanitarian assistance when performed by NGOs in the Mediterranean, and finally through impeding crossings, keeping migrants in life-threatening conditions within countries of origin and transit, rather than regulating access through safe passage means and allowing for disembarkation in places of safety in Europe. So these four effects, I have one slide per effect. I know I'm running out of time, but maybe I can take five more minutes to unpack this. So the first effect, normalizing disengagement from SAR, I just want you to see on paper how this effect is achieved and why am I claiming that it exists. The search and rescue recommendation of the European Commission, these are quotes from that document, focuses on uh, search and rescue as being an obligation under international law and um, claiming that it exists, that it binds European Union member states, but then it fails to extract any conclusions from this, any concrete implications from that obligation. Instead of clarifying what those obligations mean, what the Commission proposes is to rely on the rescue capacity stemming from private and commercial vessels instead of saying, because we have certain rescue obligations, we need to provide certain rescue services by state official means. This is said nowhere. So the effect of the Commission proposal is to normalize the withdrawal of certain rescue services provided by coastal states on the part of the European Union. Um, what the Commission also foresees is the constitution of a group that is going to exchange information and coordinate whatever happens at sea. But there isn't a call on the member states to deploy cer certain rescue services. There is a call on Frontex to provide assistance and technical support, but within European Union competence, or meeting that the search and rescue is not a European Union competence. The European Union has no power and no obligation, according to the European Union treaties, to provide search and rescue. So that's effect number one. Effect number two, the search and rescue recommendation recommends that states police the activity of search and rescue NGOs, okay, by checking that their vessels comply with all of the regulations found in the search and rescue and safety of life at sea conventions. Fair enough, but why aren't they requiring the same from the vessels of the third countries 
Coast Guards with which we engage, including the Libyan Search and Rescue Services, the Turkish Search and Rescue Services, or the Moroccan Search and, Res Search and Rescue Services. The policing of this requirements, it's only established vis-a-vis -vis search and rescue NGOs. And the effect of this is to restrict rather than expand search and rescue activities, and therefore to restrict rather than expand the possibilities that search and rescue NGOs provide rescue at sea, okay? I'm not going through every point there because otherwise I'm going to take very long. The third effect is the criminalization of search and rescue NGOs, including, for example, Proactiva Open Arms, which have been facing trials in Italy and in other jurisdictions. Italy has been the most active prosecutor on criminal law claims of search and rescue NGOs. Why? Because of the facilitation directive. The facilitation directive of 2002 defines as a facilitator, as a smuggler, any person, including you or me, who intentionally assists a person who is not a national of a member state to enter or transit the territory of a member state in breach of the laws of the state concerned. So you or me helping out a family member without a visa if they needed one, could meet this definition and be considered a smuggler and be criminally liable under EU law. What the directive also foresees is an exception to this rule. If the person is providing humanitarian assistance, is assisting somebody to cross a border for the provision of humanitarian assistance, member states may decide not to criminalize the behavior but there isn't an obligation not to, not to not criminalize, okay? So there is an option for member states not to prosecute, not to criminalize, but there isn't a duty not to do so. This has led to the prosecution of search and rescue organizations in different countries in the Mediterranean. And this is why in 2020, the European Commission issued a, a set of guidelines on how to interpret the directive of 2002. And they concluded that the facilitation directives should be interpreted so that humanitarian assistance that is mandated by law cannot and must not be criminalized. But the commission doesn't define what amounts to humanitarian assistance. And it doesn't determine when it should be considered as required by law. So that's open to speculation, and it would be at the end for judges in different member states on a case-by-case -case basis and ex post to decide whether NGOs or private persons should be criminalized or not. There are a number of other points that are minor, and I'm happy to share my slides later if you're curious, but the effect of this is that the criminalization of search and rescue organizations can continue because we do not really know what amounts to humanitarian assistance, and we do not really know when humanitarian assistance should be considered as required by law. That opens up many possibilities to prosecute and criminalize behavior as the one that has already been criminalized so far by NGOs providing search and rescue at sea. The final effect is that the plan by the European Commission fails to regulate safe disembarkation. There isn't any proposal and any clarification of where survivors should be taken or how place of safety should be defined. Instead of this, the European Commission alludes to the need to strengthen cooperation with countries of origin and transit to prevent crossings, to prevent journeys across the Mediterranean. And there isn't any discussion of what this entails and what the human rights implications of this would be. There isn't any consideration whatsoever in the plan put forward by the European Commission of our own, our as in the European Union and the member states, own certain rescue and human rights obligations. What the European Commission is trying to sell as a message is that people crossing the Mediterranean are the responsibility of countries from where they cross. They are the responsibility of Libya, of Morocco, and of Turkey. 
If they cross, this is the fault of those countries not taking the measures to impede crossings. That's the discourse, and this discourse is becoming policy. And this policy is against European values and European law. This policy, according to the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, should conform with the rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which are applicable any time that the European Union institutions intervene and any time member states act when they do within the scope of EU law. And this has been ignored. So in conclusion, and with this I finish, the new common European approach to search and rescue, what it does is to structuralize current malpractices. What is happening in practice is now being legalized through policy documents issued in September 2020. The emergency rhetoric, the crisis mode of thinking, of presenting facts and of doing policy, it's what allows for and justifies the embedment of the risk of death as a tool of control. Interdiction is presented as life-saving, as something that spares the life of those who should actually be rescued. A non-rescue is thereby being denaturalized and co-opted for things that have nothing to do with real search and rescue needs and real search and rescue obligations under international law. Search and rescue has become a component of border control and as an exception to the rule of prevention of unwanted crossings. It is being securitized as a result to spare the dangers of crossings. And in the end, what is happening is that the risk of dying is becoming normalized, banalized, is just a fact of life, something that we need to assume as irremediably happening, as if God-given. The ensuing death-based containment model consolidates a policy of withdrawal from search and rescue, disengagement from succor, where the increased probability of death of migrants becomes the standard mechanism of control of frontiers and of unwanted migration flows. As a result, the Mediterranean emerges as a necropolitical space of sovereign control through death. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry that I took a bit longer. If you are interested, there are further details in these four written pieces, if you are curious. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to open uh, the debate. So you have the floor. Podemos abrir el debate. Podéis, por supuesto, intervenir en castellano o en inglés, como queráis. Uh, veo una mano por ahí. Adelante. Hi, thank you very much for this very enlightening presentation. I'm Justine, I work here at the IMET. I work at, uh, for the project Euromesco. Um, I came to know your work through uh, my master thesis, which was uh, coordinated by Professor Casarino. And I worked on uh, the memorandum of understanding between Libya and Italy, um, looking mostly at the normalization of the role of non-state actors in these border management strategies. Um, so really, I feel really, really uh, happy to, to have you here. Um, uh, just to go back on, uh, on a point that you raised in the presentation that, uh, that is fundamental, I think, about the EU strategy um, and how the EU relies basically on the buy-in of uh, third countries, Morocco, Libya, uh, Tunisia, to, to implement this withdrawal from search and rescue. Um, I mean, it goes in... I mean, from my understanding, it goes hand in hand with another strategy to also uh, rely on these countries to also uh, put in place returns and readmission, mm -hmm. uh, providing them with visas and so on. Um, do you think that these strategies, I mean, we, we carried out recently a study with Euromesco with Maghreb and Mashrek countries on, on their perception of these new strategies uh, put in place by the EU and on the state of the cooperation between them and the EU. And 
significantly in the Maghreb countries, their perception of the state of cooperation on returns and, re returns and readmission seemed to be quite negative, and they didn't seem very convinced of the strength of the cooperation. So do you think, although I think the facts are, I mean, the, 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 your demonstration is quite clear that it's really a direction towards which the EU wants to go even stronger, to rely more and more on the external um, third countries. Do you think it's viable, uh, not just in terms of political discourse, but oper you know, on the operational level, do you think it's still viable to, to rely on them? And what could, I mean, what could the EU do uh, to, to secure this buy-in if uh, the strategy wants to survive? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for, for your question. Um, I, I do think you're very right that the, the European Union is relying on the buy-in by third countries and that there are mixed feelings by these third countries as for their role within the scheme. But I wouldn't put all of the Maghreb countries in the same sack. Um, so it's true that there's been resistance, for example, in the part of Tunisia, particularly after the Arab Spring. Tunisia is the only of the countries where the Arab Spring triumphed, and they're now trying to consolidate the democratic gains that the revolution brought. And, and they've been quite adamant uh, in the position not to ratify the readmission agreement with the European Commission. But if you look into um, the situation with Morocco, for example, Morocco has been cooperating while refusing to sign readmission, the readmission agreement with the European Union, they've been cooperating with Spain since 2005. So, and, and they are quite happy to cooperate on a bilateral basis with the member state concerned and to do so behind closed doors. So we know that there are treaties, protocols, informal deals that are um, accorded between Spain and Morocco since 2005 for the prevention of crossings into Spain from Morocco in exchange for money, in exchange for capacity building in exchange for any amount of things that Morocco would want to extract in the negotiations. Um, however, many of these documents are not public and they haven't been published. So we do not really know exactly what is it that has been accorded and, and agreed. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, of the issues with the strategy because the strategy is not democratic. It can only be achieved through undemocratic means. And it cannot be achieved in a human rights compliant way. The only way out is to informalize and to bilateralize. So there is no chance whatsoever that one of the Maghreb countries are going to ratify a formal readmission agreement with the European Union in plain sight. I don't think that that interests the European Union either. I think there is an interest on the part of the European Union to maintain secrecy, to maintain these negotiations behind closed doors, and to then blame the third country as the trigger or the proponent of this strategy, of this undemocratic way of doing policy and of doing law. But I think the benefit is mutual, because this is something that cannot be achieved democratically and it cannot be achieved in a human rights compliant manner. And so we see a proliferation of informal mechanisms with Libya, for example, Malta and Italy have bilateral memoranda of understanding, but also the Uniformed has a memorandum of understanding. The Uniformed is an EU actor. Frontex has also a memorandum of understanding to train the Libyan Coast Guard. And that's again, an EU actor engaging in this strategy. Again, what is the, context, the content of the Memorandum of Understanding? We don't know. It is presented as a non-treaty, as a technical document. And we are then guaranteed that compliance with human rights is ensured. But we cannot be sure because this policy document has not been public, published and is not public. Several people have been asking for a copy and it's never been uh, made available. So I think um, we see a, a, a reversal of, of in, in, in the power game, there's more power that, that it's being handed over to third countries because the European Union is dependent on their performance for the implementation of the strategy. At the same time, I think that the interest in the non-democratic, 
non-human rights compliant outcomes, it's not just on the part of the third countries, but it is in the interest overall of the European Union itself. Thank you very much for your for your very suggesting presentation. Certainly, it was it was amazing. I, I am very pleased. Well, I would say one of the worst things that I can say from here. Uh, I have an, a question. I have a comment. But uh, well, I have a lot of comments. But I, I will focus on on three of of that. Uh, first, about figures. Uh, uh, you have shared uh, figures. You have shared um, shows that. There is a death decrease in last years. I'd like to know if you have had in mind a Canary Road, because you have, you have um, focused on, on Mediterranean, and in fact, when we are talking about West, Western Mediterranean, it's very linked to, to Canary Road. And uh, we, have, uh, we have noticed uh, an, an increase in deaths in Canary, in Canary Road. And this is very linked with, with other things. Uh, there is a problem about unknown deaths, because when uh, it has been argued that uh, in, there is an organization that said that uh, 4,000 people uh, death um, trying to arrive to, to Spain. Uh, perhaps this omission from the European Union has increased, increased the number of unknown deaths. This is another point I'd like. Also, uh, there is an implicit thing. Uh, the role of the extreme thing rhetoric, uh, the, the extreme right uh, wing plays a, a very, very high, very strong role in criminalization of, of NGOs. And in fact, the, the, the thing is, is European Union has, has accepted this, this rhetoric, not, not directly, but implicitly. Because uh, they have, um, they have, uh, you know, NGOs are a pull factor for the for the migration. This is not um, all. All of us are paid by Soros and this kind of, of rhetoric. But in fact, uh, European Union has has been done that. How can we change this this approach, this this rhetoric in in European institutions to to avoid this and Last thing, uh, there was a denounce to the International Criminal Court about about this in a very strange role because it was a denounce against a prosecutor. It's not a, a Rome Convention um, uh, hasn't this this kind of, of possibility, but but some lawyers put the the case uh, in front of a International Criminal Court. Uh, what do you think about about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, it's true. I didn't. I didn't discuss the Canary route because in in the statistics of of Eurostat, they tend to sort of treat it as the Atlantic route rather than the Western Mediterranean. It was complicated to sort of merge the two statistics in a way that would make sense and so I decided not to, to, to do that but, but you are absolutely correct that in the Canary route we see an increase in deaths both in absolute numbers and in relative numbers. So in the Mediterranean what I discussed is that there is a decrease in deaths when you look at the absolute numbers but there is an increase in the relative numbers when you look at the ratio of the possibility of dying. In the Canary route, the increase is in, on both sides of the equation, in absolute and in relative numbers. And you are quite right that it's actually as an effect of the omission of search and rescue and the increase in interdiction in the Mediterranean that there is a displacement of the flows towards the Canary route. And the result of this is the increase in arrivals, the increase in attempted crossings, and the increase in deaths because the strategy in the Mediterranean is also replicated in the Canary route. So um, that's, 
that's absolutely correct. And, and, uh, and, and the reason why I didn't include it is because Eurostat separates them. So it was easier for me. But I think the, the analysis would, can be extrapolated to, to the Atlantic route as well. In, in terms of criminalization, the comment that you made, I, I think it's absolutely correct too. I mean, the discourse emerged in the far right, the rhetoric of, of the pull factor, the call effect, the need to stop the masses because otherwise we're going to be um, floated by irregular uh, migrants or meeting that irregular migrants are actually the refugees and the asylum seekers that are entitled to protection under international law. This has been normalized and Europeanized in public discourse, in policy, and also in law, because the facilitation directive is a direct result of this dynamic. And, and, and recourse to the possibilities of criminalization of search and rescue NGOs and individuals that provide humanitarian assistance is a direct result of this normalization of the far right position and the far right rhetoric within the European landscape. What would be necessary to change this? I mean, I, I wish that I, I knew, uh, but how I see it, in, in, in my humble opinion, there are, I think, two flanks of action that need to combine for change to be operated, the input and the output side of, of, of the equation. So I think there needs to be constant lobbying and campaigning of interested groups, NGOs, advocates, to policymakers in the relevant fora, including at the European Parliament, explaining that this is not sustainable, it's not in line with European values, it's not in line with EU law and international law, and it shouldn't happen. Um, that at the input side of the equation. At the output side of the equation, I think strategic litigation, it's the only mechanism that can force change. So if policymakers are not willing to change that because immigrants don't, don't, don't vote, and immigration and, 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 and asylum are not, are not popular subjects in elections, people are not very sympathetic. I mean, perhaps the war in, in, in Ukraine is going to change that. Perhaps our approach is about to change to asylum seekers and refugees. Who knows? But if action on the input side of the equation is not enough, then the output side of the equation should be acted on, and strategic litigation in relevant fora, including the International Criminal Court, could be uh, a good way forward. What, what um, Frontlex did, colleagues from Frontlex and the uh, legal clinic of Sciences Po in Paris, what they did in relation to this case, uh, for those who do not know, these were a number of, so several bodies collaborating, led by Frontlex, which is a dedicated NGO that looks into strategic litigation, apart from other things. What they did was to document the situation in the Mediterranean and at the external borders of the European Union from the prism of crimes against humanity. And what they claim is that the European Union actors in member states and in the European Union institutions are directly, directly perpetrating or complicit in the situation that we see occurring at the external borders of the Union that should be characterized as a crime against humanity vis-a-vis -vis migrants and refugees. And what they were trying to do is to uh, prompt an investigation by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to look into uh, possibilities to condemn European actors for these crimes. So far, that hasn't happened yet. Fatou Ben Suada, who was the, the, per, the, the prosecutor at the time, has stepped down. There is a new prosecutor from the UK that took over a few months ago. And to my knowledge, they are not looking into this. What uh, Fatou Ben Suada did was, however, uh, to open a file, an investigative file, for crimes against humanity vis-a-vis -vis migrants and refugees in Libya, perpetrated by Libyan actors on Libyan soil. So that's something, but it doesn't really respond to, to what we are talking about, which is the complicity 
and the direct involvement of European actors in this phenomenon. Echando, si no hay preguntas, te lo formulo en castellano, me contestas. Um, una reflexión y, y un par de preguntas. Oh, pues, una reflexión y un par de preguntas. Uno de los. El, el, igual suena a, a defender, ¿no? a hacer de abogado del diablo, pero uno de los problemas que tenemos o que creo que existen es que. Derecho migratorio y, y de refugiados, si queréis, ¿no? de, poniéndose en la misma cesta, aunque no sean lo mismo. Y search and rescue ¿no? y medidas de rescate son disciplinas jurídicas, o, o están, son, son ámbitos de derecho disciplinados jurídicamente de, desde perspectivas muy distintas. Y, y con lógicas muy distintas. Que... En términos de protección de los refugiados, si las hacemos converger, nos favorecen, porque generan la obligación de salvar vidas, genera un contacto que nos permite activar la solicitud de asilo, que de otra manera no hubiéramos aproximado a los potenciales solicitantes de asilo o migrantes, porque mientras no has entrado en contacto con ellos todavía no sabes lo que son, ¿sí? no se han autodefinido. Y eso... En principio es bueno, pero a, a medio plazo para los estados se ha percibido como algo que les generaba el asistir, les generaba una obligación de asilo que era justamente algo que eh, no era su voluntad primigenia, por decirlo así adelantar sus fronteras, es decir, tenemos una, una construcción del asilo basada en el Convenio de Ginebra que es territorial. Cuando tú, por razones humanitarias de protección de, refugio, ¿no? de, de asistencia, uh -huh. llevas tu acción fuera de tus fronteras marítimas, lo que estás haciendo es enervar una protección extraterritorial del asilo que no es tu concepción inicial. Y aquí es donde digo que puedo sonar un poco a, más bien que abogado del, abogado del Estado más que de abogado del diablo, pero... Y eso se ha resuelto, yo creo, como tú has descrito muy bien, ¿no? en, en, con esta, con esta mmm, renuncia a mmm, rescatar, pero porque hemos hecho esta conexión. Entonces, me parece que hemos llegado a un, hemos generado un problema en la confluencia de ambas. Y no sé muy bien, creo que ahí subyacen muchos de los problemas. ¿no? Eh, y podría elaborar un poco más en esto, pero, pero quería conocer un poco tu, tu opinión de cómo lo enfocas. Las preguntas, dos. Eh, en el fondo, hay, un, bueno, hay, hay una norma de la Comunidad Europea, de la Unión Europea, que es un reglamento de 2014 sobre, sobre eh, las normas de vigilancia en las fronteras marítimas en las operaciones en las que interviene la Unión. Es verdad uh -huh. que este último condiciona mucho, no en las operaciones de los estados, en las operaciones en las que interviene la Unión, pero sí hay normas, y ahí se establecen claramente uh -huh. algunas obligaciones. Podría ser mejor, puede ser peor, pero hay algunas normas. Eh, pero para mí el problema, una vez tienes la norma, es y, y es también en términos de litigios estratégicos que decías tú, ¿eh? es decir, ¿cuál es el esfuerzo suficiente de los estados para rescatar? ¿Cómo lo cuantificamos? Es decir, ¿Cuándo podemos considerar que un Estado está renunciando a su obligación de rescate? ¿Cuántos barcos tiene que poner? ¿Cuántas, ¿Cuál es el esfuerzo? Porque este es un poco un juego del gato y el ratón. ¿no? Entonces, Y eso no lo tenemos. Cuando, yo, cuando decimos un litigio estratégico, esto es un problema serio. Es decir, Más allá de los casos en los que se les avisa, oye, aquí hay un barco, ve a buscarlo, uy, sí, no sé, que tenemos grabaciones de estas, ahora se lo pasa a una guarda costera, a otra que eso claramente se puede reconducir al terreno penal, a la omisión del deber de socorro, podemos ir a buscar figuras, pero ¿cuál es la intensidad exigible y cuál es el punto en el que podemos decir que no se puede llegar a controlar todo el mar en términos de intervención? Y la segunda pregunta, es una pregunta que me planteo, ¿eh? sobre cuál es el estándar de exigencia razonable, porque claro, sobre las normas dice, bueno, los estados deberán ¿no? vigilar sus fronteras, bueno, ya, pero es un mar grande y tenemos los recursos que tenemos, ¿cuáles han de poner? ¿no? Porque la explicación de los estados va por aquí, 
no, es que yo no tengo recursos suficientes para patrullar a todas horas ¿no? todo, el, todo el mar. Y eso me lleva a la segunda pregunta, y es, creo que partimos hoy en día ya de un concepto que está deviniendo traicionero, elusivo, que es, si contacto contigo, si te veo desde mi barco, te protejo. Ahí emerge la obligación de rescatar. Yo creo que la obligación de rescatar emer, debería emerger desde el momento en que tengo conocimiento de que hay alguien en necesidad de rescate. Y obligaríamos toda la discusión sobre si hay que sustituir los barcos por drones. Entonces, esta, mi pregunta formulada de otra manera es ¿cuánto obliga a los estados el poseer información sobre situaciones de potencial riesgo para las vidas? El estar en el estar cerca, ¿no? la distancia, la proximidad, en, en nuestros convenios la genera. Pero ¿y la información? ¿Cuánto podemos exigir, también si quieres en clave de litigios estratégicos, la información qué deberes genera? Vale, yo no estoy al lado del barco donde se, de, de la charca donde se está ahogando una niña, pero sé que hay una niña que se está ahogando en, en una charca. ¿No estoy omitiendo mi deber de socorro? también, ¿no? es decir, por, por llevarlo al terreno un poco penal, que es tramposo. ¿eh? En este territorio las responsabilidades de los estados internacionales no se pueden equiparar a las penales, pero un poco por, por ejemplificarlo. Perdona que me haya alargado. Gracias, David. Eh, sí, a ver, respecto a la primera pregunta, el reglamento de control de fronteras marítimas del 2014, que efectivamente cuando interviene Frontex o intervienen medios efectivos europeos, no solo intervenir, tienen que también co o sea, coordinar, sí, coordinar sí, está en de el, la operación en cuestión. Ahí lo que se prevé es que, eh, por defecto, y los, los que sobrevivan un... un ay, no me vienen las palabras en español. Ay, un naufragio, tienen que ser desembarcados en el país tercero de proveniencia. Y si eso no es posible, por cualquier motivo, incluido por el principio de no devolución, entonces tienen que ser desembarcados en el estado eh, de coordinación de, de la operación. Entonces, si es Italia, pues Italia, si es España, España y así. Lo que es muy curioso, yo no he mencionado este reglamento porque es la comisión la que no lo menciona. O sea, en su nuevo plan SAR ni siquiera lo menciona. Este no, reglamento es como si no, no existiera. No lo menciona nadie nunca. No lo menciona nadie nunca, efectivamente. ¿Por qué? Pues porque en realidad el, el, la regla de, de desembarco por defecto en el tercer país de proveniencia, que sería Libia o sería Marruecos o sería Turquía, es contraria en, en el 99,9% de los casos al principio de no, no devolución. Porque el principio de no devolución, cuando existen riesgos de exposición a tortura, tratamiento inhumano, degradante o persecución, impide esa devolución. Entonces, como eso es así, pues el, el, en, rela, en realidad la regla de, de desembarco por defecto en el país tercero no es aplicable y lo que se requeriría es siempre el desembarco en el país, eh, digamos, de coordinación de la operación en cuestión, que sería Italia o sería España, porque ya Malta dijo que este reglamento no lo suscribía y que ella nunca jamás iba a ser estado anfitrión en una operación Frontex o una operación europea de estas características. Entonces, la Comisión, de manera estratégica, omite la existencia de este reglamento y omite las reglas que se encuentran en ese reglamento y que ya son vinculantes, porque es un reglamento europeo que ya es legalmente vinculante. Bien. Que, mal, que Malta diga que no suscribe un reglamento de oblig, obligatorio. Sí, no, no, no dice eso. No, Lo que no, dice no, es que no eso. accede a ser Estado anfitrión, anfitrión de, de, coordinador de una, de, una, de una operación. O sea, no pueden oponerse al, al reglamento en sí, pero se oponen a ser considerados Activarlo. Estado anfitrión y a contribuir a ningún tipo de operación de este, de este tipo. Ahora, ¿cuál sería el nivel suficiente de, de, de SAR, de, de Search and Rescue, ¿no? de rescate por parte de un Estado? No te sé decir si 10, 100 o 1000, pero lo que estoy segura es que no es cero. ¿Vale? Y entonces la situación en la que estamos es de cero. No hay, no hay una, un, un, un mecanismo proactivo de, de salvamento por parte de la Unión Europea fomentado por parte de los Estados. Lo que hay es lo contrario. Italia canceló su operación de rescate en el 2014 y lanza eh, una operación de criminalización contra las ONGs a partir del verano de 2017, en su lugar. Frontex firma un, un memorándum of understanding con Libia 
y cada vez que sus drones detectan a alguien que puede morir en el mar, lo que hacen es pasarle las coordinadas a Libia para que sean ellos los que vengan y recojan a la persona en cuestión, si todavía está viva, y la devuelvan a Libia, a pesar del principio de no devolución. Y Malta pues, está imitando lo, lo, lo mismo. Y lo más curioso, por ejemplo, es la Una Formet. Una Formet es European Naval Force for the Mediterranean. Y, y, y lo más curioso es que a partir de 2019 una fuerza naval, una operación de la Fuerza Naval Europea para el Mediterráneo, cancela todos los efectivos navales. No hay barcos. Estamos hablando de operación naval sin barcos. Y en su lugar lanza drones. Entonces, yo no sé cuál es el nivel óptimo de Search and Rescue. Lo bueno sería que nadie muriera en el mar. Pero lo que sí sé es, a contrario, que cero no es. Entonces, no puedes lanzar una operación naval sin barcos y hacerlo porque a nivel estratégico eso te va a permitir omitir las obligaciones de, de socorro, de asistencia y de rescate y de salvamento que se imponen a partir del derecho internacional. El, el problema, yo creo, viene no tanto de, de la definición del nivel óptimo de, de salvamento y de rescate, sino de la presión que se ha puesto en un, en un sistema que se suponía que iba a ser excepcional. O sea, el sistema de SAR, cuando se ideó, cuando se diseñó, mmm, lo que se planteaba era que la gente no iba a necesitar tirarse al mar para, para alcanzar eh, asilo o, 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 o seguridad personal. Y que entonces era un sistema que se iba a utilizar de manera mm, puntual. Lo que ha pasado es que con el cierre de las vías legales de acceso se ha generado una presión sobre el sistema que es anómala. Y entonces ese sistema ahora está en, en, en un punto... Mm, que no puede abarcar la demanda, la demanda que se ha, a la que ha sido sometido. Entonces, si se abriesen vías legales de acceso para refugiados y migrantes forzosos a través de visados humanitarios, de resettlement, de reasentamiento, de, eh, no sé, mecanismo de evacuación, no haría falta utilizar la vía marítima como acceso al asilo. Entonces, yo creo que por ahí se descongestionaría toda la demanda en un sistema que no nace para cumplir la función que se le está queriendo pedir que cumpla en este momento, y eh, se recuperaría el espíritu de la Convención de Ginebra del 51. Eh, el comentario que has hecho de que hay eh, eh, un desfase ¿no? entre el carácter extraterritorial del, del mecanismo SAR, del, del, del sistema de rescate marítimo, y por otro lado, del derecho de inmigración y de refugio, que nace con vocación territorial, y que por eso no solamente responden a una disciplina diferente, sino que también mmm, lo que hacen es seguir caminos diferentes, lógicas que también son distintas. ¿no? Eso es cierto, pero lo que ha pasado a partir de los años 80 y 90 es que eh, el derecho de inmigración también se ha extraterritorializado. O sea, los mecanismos de control de inmigración eran territoriales hasta el 80-90, cuando se lanzan las medidas masivas de visados para prevención de flujos migratorios no deseados, se introducen las eh, multas, las, las, la criminalización de eh, transportistas que vayan a, a, a transportar a, a quien no esté en posesión de, de un visado y un pasaporte eh, en regla y se lanzan toda suerte de mecanismos de interceptación de flujos migratorios no deseados. O sea que la extraterritorialización de la parte de control del derecho migratorio se acepta. Lo que no se acepta es la parte de derechos de los inmigrantes. Entonces se hace una extraterritorialización selectiva y que no corresponde. Si los extraterritorializas, que parece un trabalenguas, hay que extraterritorializarlo todo, no solamente aquella parte del derecho de inmigración que otorga poderes a los estados, sino aquellos que también generan obligaciones y que reconocen derechos a las personas migrantes. Entonces, lo que yo creo que no puede pasar es que el Estado seleccione y estrategice eh, lo que, las normas que va a cumplir y las que no va a cumplir. O lo aplicas todo o no lo aplicas nada. No puedes solamente utilizar aquellas eh, disposiciones que generan poder, que, generan, que, que maximizan la soberanía del, la soberanía del Estado y, y dejar de un lado e ignorar aquellas que generan obligaciones. 
Yo lo que creo es que habría que seguir pues, la Convención de Viena de, de Interpretación de Tratados, el principio de buena fe del artículo 26 y el principio de interpretación evolutiva y sistemática que requiere una interpretación contextualizada. Entonces, no solo la extraterritorialización parcial de, de las medidas migratorias no ha lugar, sino que lo que se requiere es que se tengan en cuenta también las medidas del derecho marítimo y del derecho del mar. Las obligaciones SAR tienen que ser tenidas en cuenta en cualquier iniciativa que se adopte para control fronterizo y control de flujos migratorios. El pick and choose, el, la selección estratégica, no cabe no solamente dentro del derecho migratorio, sino tampoco mmm, dentro de las obligaciones ya contra, contratadas por parte de los Estados. Los Estados tienen que cumplirlas todas, a no ser que denuncien el tratado en cuestión. ¿no? Y, y, por último, respecto de la... Eh, los deberes que genera la información, el saber que alguien se está muriendo, alguien necesita ayuda, se está ahogando en medio del Mediterráneo, ¿qué es lo que habría que hacer? Eh, existe una, bueno, una, una sentencia, una disposición del, del Comité de Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas en un caso contra Italia que se llama S.A. contra Italia. Hay otro paralelo que es S.A. contra Malta de, de 2021 en el que se establece que la información... El, cuando alguien llama a un eh, MRCC, un Maritime Rescue Coordination Center, o sea, un centro de coordinación de salvamento marítimo de un Estado, genera una relación de dependencia que activa una relación de jurisdicción que activa a su vez las obligaciones bajo el derecho a la vida del Estado en cuestión. Entonces, Italia, al ignorar y al ralentizar una respuesta a una distress call, como se llamaría en inglés, eh, por parte de, un, de una persona que estaba ahogándose y, 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 de hecho, al final se ahogó, fueron sus, sus familiares los que llevaron el caso a Naciones Unidas. Eso desató una cadena causal que produjo la responsabilidad de Italia. O sea que, de hecho, el conocimiento genera responsabilidad, no ya porque lo digamos nosotros, sino que incluso el Comité de Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas lo ha determinado así en este caso de S.A. contra Italia. No sé si hay alguna pregunta más. Si no, pues muchísimas gracias o podemos continuarlas en la conversación no más informal después. Muchas gracias, Violeta, por tu... Por gracias. tu presentación y tu contestación. Gracias, gracias, gracias David y gracias a todos por, por estar, por venir y por interesaros por este tema. Gracias.